your late love and how did we come across the title such as that. As uh, Nivi puts it on the cover, it's very difficult to think of how do you couple your love really? I mean, there seems, seems to be so little love in the love. And I want to talk a little bit about why there's so little love in the law. give you an example and then see if, and look at how law actually links to the love. The, I want to pull up one case in 1933, you know, a boring case, no, no, very interesting case in 1933. <laughs> 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 i tell you why it's interesting. Because uh, the case is actually, it's a story about the guy cruising, you know, written in judicial prose. There's this guy called Narsh this guy called Narshan is running a restaurant in, in, in Sin in 1934. And he meets this guy called Ratan Singh comes to his comes to his restaurant. And if you were there as a, as Narshan and see this cute, cute guy called Ratan Singh coming in, you say, Hey, I haven't seen you for a really long time. So Ratan Singh says, No, I haven't had an opportunity to come here for a really long time. Then um, Ratan Singh walks off. So what would Narshan want do? He does what any gay man in Delhi in the city would do. Trots off after Ratan <laughs> so, <laughs> saying, I mean, hey, and then they go and meet somewhere near the pier, and then they have some kind of conversation, and then Narshavan gestures to him, and they both go up to Narshavan's room. Obviously, you can make out that Ratan is a poor working class guy, he doesn't really have a room. Narshavan is there, he owns a restaurant, so he has a room. So they go to the room, and normally this would be in a case of two guys having sex in the privacy of their home, and who cares? It doesn't matter. But what actually happens in this fascinating case is the police bill is looking through the win peep window hole. He's peeping through and he sees these guys having sex. And he sees what these guys, and what he sees is, in the words of the judge, he sees Narshirwan, Ratansi sitting on Narshirwan's organ. And he sees Ratansi then getting up after Narshirwan had spent himself and put his pants on. This is the way that the, the case is described. And then, this is boring. And then, <laughs> and, and at which point, the policeman looks and says, I'm going to arrest these guys, picks these two guys up, take, marches them to the police station, files a case against them, and three cents up. This is one of the first cases of consenting sex between two adults, which is captured in judicial record. So in a sense, I mean, what you call them is the, the unknown frontiersmen in the history of the struggle against the Reference. And in another way, what they stand for is for uh, another famous couple, which is uh, Lord Alfred Douglas and Oscar Wilde. Mm -hmm. Because what is what happens as Narshirwan, uh, Ratansi is made to pose as the complainant. He's made to pose as being forced into having sex with with, with Narshirwan, and therefore uh, it's a case of a uh, case of of, uh, of of an offence against three, under three seventy seven. Uh, so the case goes up to the goes up to the court, and the way the judges speak about it, the language they use. I just want to read. read you already have got a sense of the language, but what the judge says is the offence made punishable under 377 requires that penetration, however little, should be put strictly. Thus, an attempt to commit this offence should be an attempt to thrust the male organ into the anus of the passive agent. Some activity on the part of the accused in that particular direction ought to be proved strictly. A mere preparation to the operation should not necessarily <laughs> That's what the judge said. say. And uh, the, the judge, in the end of the day, acquits him. So there's, not, there's not enough evidence to show that he had actually attempted to commit the offense. There's not even preparation to commit the offense. From technical ground, he acquits not him. But he passes really harsh strictures against poor uh, Ratansi. He says he, Ratansi appears to be a despicable specimen of humanity. <laughs> On his own admission, he's addicted to the vice of a catamite. And he says there's not the slightest symptom of violence in the hind part of the lad. So there's certain <laughs> ways he speaks about sex, and sex in a way which is very far from the language of love, really. And that's 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 the point I want to make. I mean, if you look at Narshirwan's case, it's emblematic of the way the, the judiciary spoke about, about gay people right from 1860 right up to 2000 and 2009. That was the way, that was the way they spoke about it. And uh, taking out Musadat's point, there's very little, you can imagine that Narshirwan and Ratan want to construct a little community of love. They're imagining a world 
which is not yet there. But that is a world which is just completely in the realms of imagination, and they can't they can't really live out the life that they want to live out in that particular that that particular age. So that is really the way that the judiciary looked at this, in spite of the coming to force of the Indian Constitution. So I mean, if we thought of writing this book, Law Like Love, and taking a story like Nasir Law, it's an act of imagination on our part because there is no love in the way the judiciary talks about Nasir Law. They talk about it in the basically carnal and the purely crude terms. There's no space for linking of the act of sex to the entire realm of relationality and emotions. That's not there within the terms of the law. What makes a dramatic change, and why this book title really becomes possible, is once again what a lot of the speakers around here have said, Srimur most eloquently last, is the language of Justice Shah and Justice Mundita. That's what made this entire coupling of law and love really possible. And what Justice Shah and Justice Mundita did in the, in the courts, and once again, those of you who are there in the hearings, is for the first time, we got a sense that you could speak about sex without a sneer. You could speak about sex in the context of, of a relationality. Re, re, relation, relation, as the as read, the National Coalition Judgment, right? They're saying it's not the state's rule to decide who your partner should be. And that's the language that judges adopt. The judicial discourse, once again, Gautam referred to it, is often one of contempt. If my colleague Lawrence Jang refers to it as there's an index of responses to the judicial judici uses of power and humiliation, right? There's a smirk, and there's one common experience all of us lawyers have, which is take a file and you, can, you, you give them your lordship. This is the, this is the Liberal Commission report you submitted to them. He takes it and throws it. That's the common response. We get stuff thrown at us all the time. We get very, <laughs> very <laughs> So they, they aim to humiliate them. What Justice oh, Shah and Justice Moody did, they didn't humiliate. They listened to you with certain level empathy. For the first time, we actually felt. I mean, taking from the history of Russia until, until now, for the first time, we were heard in an empathetic manner by the judiciary. And that signaled a very, very uh, a shift in the way the judiciary saw uh, gay and lesbian people themselves. And um, uh, we try and document three moments of shift in the way the judiciary looked, looked at gay and lesbian people. One is the entire reading of the, of the National Coalition Judgment. It's really a very powerful judgment which talks about, once again, the linking of law and love. And the second is, of course, the uh, once again, I think I should read this, a uh, small section where how did they respond to the norm, normal stuff which is thrown at queer people, right? What, what are the normal stuff which is thrown at queer people? Your guys are per language of perversion, your guys are perverse, your guys are unnatural, your guys just want to have fun. There's a link of uh, blood and sex and gore and whole range of stuff. And uh, this happened in the, co in, the, in the court as well. And uh, I just want to very briefly read to you what uh, yeah. This is the uh, basically one of the arguments of one of the council. I won't name the council. And uh, the council says in his argument the anus is not designed by nature for any intercourse. And if the penis enters the rectum, the victim is found to get injury. The activity causes bodily harm. Chief Justice Shah asked whether the submission that the act itself causes injury has been argued before. Whereas then WHO reports, etc. Then Mr. Sharma, of course, goes on to <laughs> <laughs> make the point. Drink and drugs are employed to obtain consent and increase enthusiasm. This is genital torture on anus, testes, bloodletting, burning of penis. <laughs> then he, once again, Mr. Shah asks him a question. Mr. Sharma ignores him and just continues reading. He says, homosexuals enjoy group sex and even enjoy committing violence. The sexual perversity and criminal acts warranting prosecution were committed in the course of that perversity. And he says, it's disconcerting to see tendency of homosexuals in the group sex. Justice Shah sharply inter interjects and then asks, counsel, is there a personal experience that you know this? <laughs> <laughs> and what the point I want to make really is, uh, I mean, I'll just read that, that one paragraph. Is that the discourse of love and affection, intimacy and longing became a part of the judicial register and displaced the relentless focus on the stripped down homosexual act as a threat as a threat to civilization at, at its very roots. The conflation of homosexuality with excess to, to focus on group sex was challenged by the nature of judicial questioning and the discourse about homosexuality is linked to context of emotion and feeling. A new new path was being forged in learning to talk about intimacy, which Narshir Van Ratan say had shared within the terms of the law. For the first time it seemed possible to see Narshir Van Ratan say and many others like them, in terms other than the basically carnal, 
and the opening of that possibility was to credit to the empathetic listening which Chief Justice Shah and Justice Mutidhar um, demonstrated. And uh, I think I just end with that to say that I think the basically to make the point that the, the title is made possible because of the context of the judgment. I don't, don't think we could have come with a title like this if we didn't have a judgment like that. So I think the struggle now is to ensure how do we ensure that we continue speaking in this language, even post the judgment, uh, depending on the way the Supreme Court decides to come out.